Okay, so I got an opportunity to work with this new flux encoder. It's an inductive. Uh, the advantages are it's axial, not radial. So you don't have to worry so much about the gap. Um, it's like having multiple read heads too. So you don't have to be so worried about the concentricity and the gap can be a, a little more lax. Um, so it's got, it's a, uh, it's not a match pair, so once the stator gets mounted, then the rotor can be changed out. That's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, you don't have to worry so much about getting it in the center or get a perfect gap, so you have some leniency on the uh, concentricity based on the encoder diameters. Um, So this encoder that we're using today is going to be a 23-bit based on the diameter, and that's the standard single turn absolute resolution. And we're going to we're going to use the BIS. There's also an incremental option, so you could have both or either. Here's some mounting instructions here. It's good for the mechanical engineer, but again, it's much easier than a radial encoder, much more rugged and reliable too. So I like these new inductive encoders. They're, they're pretty, pretty awesome. Um, so we're going to take a look at, yeah, here's the clock and the data. This is an SSI. We're not going to use the SSI, but you get the idea. You clock out the data. Um, there's the incremental uh, A, A not B, B not X, X not or index. I wouldn't connect the shield to the motor case, maybe the motor case to earth, but not the shield, although you know, there's a picture of it, but it turned out okay, but I just shielded at the drive side. Uh, there's the BIS, 5 megahertz, 32 bit, so we'll have to do a little bit of uh, uh, alignments using the multi-turn. Oh, I like the colors here, so red, yellow, green, so if it's yellow, normal operation, but an error was detected. Yeah, we'll detect that in Copley too. But it's nice to have the LEDs telling you if it's uh, good, not so good, or or horrible. So check cabling, grounding, shielding. Um, and you've got your clocks and your data. So data plus blue uh, minus red. Clock plus gray minus pink plus five is violet. Ground is black. Um, and if you had, uh, I mean, this would be a sense line for long distance, so you might as well just double it up with a plus five of ground. But if you if you wanted incremental, is A, A not B, B not an index, so uh, that's an option, or one or the other, or both even. Haven't seen that yet, but uh, yeah, here's the uh, cable options, different cable types and the colors and the pinouts. Um, so that's all good. And then here's that shield again. I, Motor case, yes, but feedback shield, no. Um, they did a good job documenting this, so it's not multi-term, but they'll say, hey, it's 23 bits, but uh, number of revs is uh, 512, so that's 9 bits, so that adds up to 32. Well, let's see. Oh, yeah, ignore multi-turn, active low, air before. Um, so let's take a look and see how we did this in CME. Um, we wanted to hit some higher speeds. I don't know, maybe we could try 7,000. Oh, it's 2,800. Okay, so maybe that's fine, but actually this will double uh, using the bit resolution we selected, but we cannot use the downshift, okay, because of this unusual interpretation of the standard. We're going to say single turn 21 bits instead of 23, and we're going to ignore two bits. This is not a downshift, but like this will downshift the encoder count or move over the encoder count. And nine bits, of, it's not really multi-term, but we used it to use up all 32 bits. So a little bit of a trick. And the main trick is override the encoder counts per rev to the same as the number of turns per rev. So even though it's 23 bits, we did two alignment bits to bring the count down to 21 to make it less counts per rev so we could hit our high speed and not overspeed the 32-bit signed integer for velocity. Um, active low, error before position alignment status, that's good. See, the downshift is gone. You can't use it because we're overriding <coughs> to get the use up all the bits. <coughs> it is a 4 megahertz. We could do 
slower, but it's fine with the plus drive. Um, and updated the position loop rate every 250 microseconds. If it was current loop only, of course, every 62.5 microseconds. Um, if you had a CRC fault because of a bolt of lightning, ignore one, two, or three of the CRC errors, but everything works here is don't ignore your feedback, fix the cabling problem. Uh, if you have a break, you can come to a controlled stop or for safe torque off. This will be in program position mode. Somebody wrote a CVM program to use indexer registers. Here's the data for the motor. Yep, so you can't go too fast. <clears throat> current loop's all tuned up. Uh, it gets about a kilohertz of current loop bandwidth. This is a direct drive motor. <clears throat> so maybe, <clears throat> maybe a little bit more bandwidth uh, than, yeah, one kilohertz is fine. And then the velocity loop is all tuned up uh, for stiffness. I moved the pole out. There's no load here yet. I mean, if you had a large inertia compared to the motor inertia, you might dial this down to 100. And you may have to lower the VP and VI again. And so that's maybe twice as much for less bandwidth. But yeah, right now, direct drive, lots of move and settle. So that's pretty cool. Uh, position loop is all tuned up. Um, so now that we can hit the, uh, the desired, you know, I, want, I need to go 2,500 or less, like, this number must be 10 or 20% greater than anything you want to do. Uh, we can make a move now in position mode. And so 1,000 RPM, 100, 100 for XL and D-cell. Let's make a move. This will be a, a 10 rev profile velocity with some following error. Uh, what happens if we want to go faster? Let's do 2,000. So that, that worked good. Reading trace data. Yeah, uh, well, I probably need to accelerate a little harder. We got plenty of current here, so we could do that, but um, let's just do a typical move. Trapezoidal, I'm not even doing this curve, and it's move and settle pretty good, so this is well tuned. If you notice, before you're even moving, <clears throat> you get plus or minus a couple of counts here, so it looks like uh, normal quantization of the digital feedback device, plus or minus a count or two. And then after the move is done, uh, it's a little bit of air while you're accelerating, a little bit of air while you're deceling, and not so, not so bad while you're running, a little bit of ripple in there, probably a little torque detent, but not very big. And then uh, plus or minus a few counts uh, based on your tuning. And maybe do a little bit more integral here. You might get some overshoot on that though. So yeah, there's some little little too much integral on that one. So it depends on your inertia and how close to you know the tracking window you're trying to get. Um, but we are within. Well, let's just go back to a lower value. So yeah, this this uh, this system seems to be pretty pretty well grounded. There's not a lot of excessive noise on the on the feedback device. Let's go back to the 60 again. That looked pretty good. <clears throat> so move and settle within 10 counts, and I'm just tweaking it a little bit here. Um, you know, when you ha have a big inertia. You're going to come back and adjust this anyway, so uh, depending on how big the inertia is, within five counts. So if you had to wait before you got to a certain, you know, resolution before you could do a cut or something, uh, you could reduce the uh, tracking window down to like, I don't know, 100 counts, 10 counts for a short period of time, depending on how long, you know, what's the top speed for the move. Um, we got a little bit of time here, so let's see if we can shorten the move time. Whoa. Oh, I went a little too fast for that. Yeah, yeah, so I'm hitting a voltage limit here. I can see the following error growing. So uh, with this back EMF IR drop, I got 120 instead of 240. Yeah, of course I can't hit the uh, top speed yet. But uh, 1,800 maybe, I think that's what Steve said he did with it. Let's give that a shot. 
And just watch that the following year doesn't start to exponentially increase. So, yeah, maybe, you know, we should just not go too fast with 120, wait for the 240. And then let's take a peek at the current. Uh, we'll do current, actual current. And so this is just with the motor inertia, whatever that is. And you'll see some peak current required. So that's like a couple of two, three amps. And then we can crank this up. So this will consume a little bit more peak current. I think this drive would do 15. The motor's like 13. So yeah, we could have, you know, for 50 revs per second per second, we can easily do 10 times the inertia and not even consume the motor's rate of current. And then the move and settle still looks uh, pretty darn good there. All right, uh, thanks for learning about the new flux encoder. Uh, let me know if you need any help setting it up. We got some good notes here, thanks.